Amos, thank you for that wonderful oration. Um, there are hundreds of questions this audience would want to hear you answer, but in the short time we have, I'll ask a few and then I'll open up the floor. So fear not that you won't get a, a, a look in this evening. Um, we just heard you speak about fanaticism and fanatics and also antidotes to fanaticism. You mentioned curious people, you mentioned humour, and you also talked about the power of imagination. I've read that you once said about your own writing that your job is to imagine the other. Is that what you hope to inspire in the people who read your books? That's what literature does, not just my books. Every literature does this. It makes us imagine other people, put ourselves under the skins of other people. You know, let me tell you, tell you a little story. When I was a little boy, six or seven or eight, my parents used to take me to cafes in Jerusalem where they conducted long conversations with their friends and they asked me to shut up, to keep quiet, and they promised me that if I behave myself and be quiet, I'll get ice cream in the end. And they conducted their conversations with their friends for 77 hours or something like this. And I had to keep myself busy. So I began to spy on other guests in the cafe. I looked at the body language. I overheard snatches of conversation. I looked at the clothes. And I began to invent their stories for them. I still do that when I have to kill time at an airport or in a clinic or in a railway station. It's a wonderful pastime recommended to every one of you and you get ice cream in the end. <laughs> um, going back to something else you said in your oration this evening, you said that the, the tragedy of the clash between the Israeli Jew and the Palestinian Arab is that it's not a Hollywood movie where there are good guys and bad guys. The tragedy is that it's a clash between right and right. What do you mean? Well, the Palestinians are in Palestine for the same reason for which the Norwegians are in Norway or the Greeks are in Greece. This is their homeland. They have no other homeland. They tried. They were forced to try. They were pushed out of Palestine into exile in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Jordan. They were not received well anywhere. They learned the hard way that they have no other homeland but Palestine. The Israeli Jews have no other homeland but Israel. The Jewish people as a people never, never had a homeland. As individuals, yes, but as a people never had a homeland other than the land of Israel. It is their land, it is our land. It's a dispute between right and right, between one very powerful, very convincing, very persuasive claim and another claim no less powerful, no less convincing, no less persuasive. I want to ask you a question about the protests that we've all read about that are happening in Tel Aviv. But first, I wanted to ask about the wave of change we've seen happen across the Arab world, referred to as the Arab Spring. What do you think the Arab Spring might change in relation to Israel and Palestine? Well, it's very hard to be a prophet coming from the land of the prophets. There's too much competition in the prophecy business. But my suggestion will be to speak not of the Arab Spring, but of Arab Springs in the plural and not in the singular. Different things are happening in different countries and the outcome in Syria is not necessarily the prospected outcome in Egypt and the outcome in Egypt is not going to be the same as in Yemen. What the outcome will be, nobody knows. On the same parades, on the same marches, on the same demonstrations in the same squares in the Arab countries, there are Democrats, 21st century oriented people, open society advocates marching together shoulder to shoulder with fundamentalist, medievalist Islamists. Who will prevail? Nobody knows. There is a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde there. But if democracy prevails in any Arab country, there will be peace. As you all know, there has never been, been war between two democracies. Never, not once in history. So I believe as soon as there is democracy in an Arab country, there will be eventually, perhaps not overnight, but eventually peace between Israel and that Arab democracy. As I mentioned before, we've all been reading in the newspaper over the last you know, week or so, these massive social protests that are happening in Tel Aviv. Um, it's not all that common that you see people in Israel take to the streets in this way. And I wondered, is this in some way related to what else is happening in the Arab world? Is there, is there a feeling, is there a fervor for change, to see change? 
Well, it's not happening in Tel Aviv. It's happening all over Israel, in big towns and small towns and even in villages. And it seems like an upheaval of the Israeli middle class who has been heavily weighed by an impossible distribution of the riches. Israel used to be a relatively egalitarian society, and perhaps not even relatively, perhaps a real egalitarian society in the old times, in the early years, when Israel was much, much poorer than it is now, but nonetheless, people cared about one another, and there was a strong sense of social solidarity. I think what the demonstrators in Tel Aviv and other towns and villages in Israel are missing the most is the this sense of social demo, uh, uh, solidarity. What began as an outcry for affordable accommodation easily and quickly evolved into an outcry for social justice and even an outcry for a restoration of the welfare state. It's going to be very interesting. Is it related to the events in the Arab countries or not? Maybe in a superficial way, but I think it was, in a long, it was a long time coming. The Israeli economy is doing exceptionally well. The unemployment rate is among the lowest in the Western world. The gross national product and the gross national income is remarkable and impressive and growing very rapidly. And yet, the riches does not flow down. It remains in the hands of the very rich. And there is a sense of outcry for social justice among those demonstrators all over Israel. Um, in September, most of us know Palestine is planning to go to the UN to seek recognition as an independent state. Um, if that is successful, what, if anything, do you think that will change? What is that about? And what do you think it might change between Israel and Palestine? Let me give you a one-man opinion, and please remember that I only represent myself, and even this only on a lucky night. <laughs> uh, if Palestine declares independence and is recognized by the UN, let Israel be the first nation to recognize Palestine, independent Palestine. <laughs> we may then argue about the borders. We may then argue about the holy places in Jerusalem, but let this be an argument, a bargaining, a negotiation between two sovereign states. At last it will become a normal disagreement between two neighboring states. Israel will do well to be the first country in the world to recognize independent Palestine for historical reasons. Um, a while back you sent a copy of your memoir, Tales of Love and Darkness, to jailed Fatah leader Marwan Barghouti with this dedication. This is our story, and I hope you read it and understand us better, hoping you will soon see peace and freedom. You received a lot of criticism for that. Why was that something you wanted to do? Yes, I came under heavy fire in Israel for dedicating a book to a Palestinian leader who spends a life sentence in an Israeli jail for terrorism, Mawan Bagoti, who is quite likely to become the next Palestinian leader. I have known Barghouti since the days of before the Intifada and before his imprisonment. He was a Palestinian patriot, a strong Palestinian patriot, but secular and pragmatic. If he ever leads the Palestinian people, he might prove to be a negotiable partner for Israel. I thought sending him my autobiographical book, A Tale of Love and Darkness, will be a certain investment in opening the heart and the mind of an enemy, and he's definitely an enemy, in opening the mind and the heart of an enemy to get a better understanding of our story. And I don't regret doing it. I would have done this again. If I could send a copy of my book to Ahmadinejad, hoping to change his mind and heart, I will send him a copy as well. We were just speaking about Palestinian leaders, but you've been invited, I've heard you say in other interviews, that you've been invited a number of times throughout your career to the homes of great politicians and Israeli leaders. They invite you for tea, they ask your opinions on many things, they listen acutely, and then they ignore what you've, been, what you've told them. But uh, of the ones that you've met, who did you find most receptive of the Israeli leaders you've spoken to? 
Well, most receptive is a very hard question. Most impressive was David Ben-Gurion, whom I had the honor and the privilege to meet as a very young man. And it was an awesome meeting, which I'll never forget. He was the single most impressive individual I've ever met in my life. There was something biblical, Old Testamental, about Ben-Gurion. He was a fascinating man, as fierce and focused as a laser beam. And he had a presence which I have never confronted before or after in my life. Uh, open to persuasion is a hard question. Perhaps Levi Eshkol, who was the pragmatic, the humorous prime minister, and unjustly forgotten prime minister of Israel in the 1960s, he was the most open-minded and the most receptive of them all. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He used to say, a human being is only a human being, and even this is very rare. Very good. Um, jumping around a little bit, at the moment in a lot of the criticism of Israel, we hear the word apartheid a lot um, in the BDS movement and from other journalists. And I wonder why that word has, has, is being used now. Out of laziness. Apartheid is bad, and the Israeli occupation and suppression of the West Bank is bad. But these are two different kinds of evil and two different degrees of evil. There is nothing racist in the Israeli suppression of the Palestinians. It's not about race, it's not about color, it's not even about faith. It's about insecurity, to be precise. The Israelis are suppressing the Palestinians because they are immensely insecure and because they are greedy for the West Bank. They want the West Bank for themselves. This is bad, but apartheid it is not. The comparison, the popular comparisons between Israeli politics and apartheid is a result of trendy laziness. 